Hey everyone, thanks for joining us. Jack Curry here on Yes, We're Here. But more importantly, joining me today is a pitcher that I absolutely loved covering, loved interviewing, Jim Abbott from California. And Jim, first of all, thanks for joining us. And first and foremost, how is everyone in your family doing during this surreal and, and turbulent time? Oh, thanks, Jack. Great to join you. Um, you know, we're doing all right. We're doing all right. We're, um, we're lucky we're out here in California. My two daughters uh, came home from school. And, um, you know, we're pretty fortunate that we're, we're isolating. We're taking it seriously. We're watching the news like everybody else. And, and um, you know, sending, sending prayers out to everybody back in New York and, and around the country who's fighting this thing. And um, crazy times, crazy, absolutely. It's opening day. We should be watching baseball. And, and here we are just talking about it. And that's a perfect segue because that's why I want to have you on here is to talk about baseball. We know all that is swirling around us and we know we want to be safe and smart, stay home, make smart decisions. But you mentioned those two words, Jim, and they're such beautiful words in the English language, opening day. I have two questions for you about opening day. Currently, if this had been opening day, would you have been locked in on a specific game or games as a retired baseball player? What, what is your opening day like, your routine? You know, I, I love opening day like everybody else, every, all baseball fans. I turn the first game on in the morning, whatever it is, uh, if it's the Reds or whoever starting off the season. And then I just kind of watch it throughout the day and, and um, you know, just kind of familiar myself with new rosters, some of the new players, watch some of the favorites. Um, you know, out here in California, I'm a I'm a Joe fan and, and Mike Trout fan. We're excited. You know, and I'm anxious to see what Joe Madden's going to do. I would be definitely tuned in today. I'd have it on all day. I'd probably cook something fun, barbecue outside, and, and uh, you know, get the season started. I, I miss that quite a bit, actually. That, that day is coming. It's coming for all of us because I'm with you. I'd, I'd be sitting in the studio right now getting ready for a pregame or a postgame, and I, I know those days are coming, but – how about back to when you were a player? You, you experienced so many opening days. Is there an opening day that stands out for you as the most memorable? My, my favorite opening day um, was my first – it wasn't actually opening day opening day, but it was the home opener for the New York Yankees in 1993. Um, I remember – you know, it was my first time with the Yankees. I'd been traded over from the Angels – uh, you know, trying to figure out my place in the rotation that spring, trying to figure out my place in, in the new environment and, and, and in the pinstripes. And uh, Buck Showalter, our manager, told me I was going to have the opening, opening home opener start back in Yankee Stadium, which um, was just amazingly cool. You know, I came from the Angels, um, which was a, a really great place to play for four years, but the Yankee environment – to come to Yankee Stadium, um, it wasn't long after the first World Trade Center bombing. So uh, it was a very serious and sort of somber time at the ballpark, but yet there was this festive um, mood of, of baseball being back. And, and I remember so many things about that day. I remember all my teammates being out there taking batting practice. And we had some new guys on the team, Wade Boggs, Jimmy Key, Paul O'Neill. You know, we'd all kind of come in that same class. So. There was a sense of excitement and renewal, and, and to have that opening day start, uh, the red, white, and blue bunting of Yankee Stadium, <laughs> you've always grown up seeing it, um, and, and we went out and won the game. I pitched well that day, and, and we beat David Cohn, and uh, I'm sorry to tell you that. <laughs> but, uh, it, it was just an amazing day, and, and, and I, it just felt like um, the whole city was watching, and, and um, it was a ton of fun. You pitched the complete game that day. Some of these games, I can't remember. I do remember that game, in part because you talked about Cone, and you beat the Royals 4-1 to one that day. And as a guy trying to acclimate himself to new surroundings, that must have been a, a, a pretty sweet way to get things rolling for you. It was so sweet. I mean, I, that's one of my favorite highlights of my whole career, to be honest, um, just because it had been such a – tumultuous winter being traded I didn't expect to be traded I came to a new team uh, you know there was nobody knew quite the direction the Yankees were going to take I mean this was the 
sort of the beginning of the ascent of the Yankees to turn into what they became in, the, in those few years. And you remember that well. Um, and, and, you know, I, I pitched, uh, you know, I pitched well that game, pitched a complete game opening day, which is, which is kind of crazy to think about these days. And I remember as the game ended, I kind of threw my hands in the air and, you know, maybe a little bit more of a celebration than you would do in a normal regular season game, but it just felt so great. It just felt, um, you know, you know like, like I said, to be a part of the organization and in that stadium. And uh, I will forever cherish Yankee Stadium and the fans there and the city. There's another moment where you threw your hands in the air and you were pretty excited on September 4th, 1993. I know in, in past years, I've made sure to text you on the anniversary of that no hitter. How often do people bring up that no hitter and how much do you cherish that moment, those memories that you built that day? Uh, you know, amazingly, people bring it up all the time, particularly if I go back to New York City. Um, I, I love the game. I, I love that game because of the connection it has given me to the, to the organization and to the city in ways that I never imagined when it happened. I mean, it, um, uh, just the finish of that game and, 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 and walking around Manhattan that night and, you know, the taxi stopping in the street and all the back, you know, the picture on the back of all the papers in, in the city. Um, you know, it, it's um, in some ways it's, it's not fair that one game is like that, but it, it, I love it a lot, Jack, because um, I always wanted to be good. You know, and uh, I played differently. I grew up missing my right hand. I was along for a long time. I was a human interest story, and and I think and and rightly so. And and in the time since that game to this day, I see the power of being able to tell that story, mm -hmm. and, and it gives some validation to having that moment of accomplishment, having that moment of success, and. And I, and I don't mean to add some grand meaning to it, but I know a lot of people have latched on to that game and it has sent a message. So I'm proud of it and for all those reasons. I, th I think you're stealing my notes because that was actually going to be my next question. <laughs> how, how did this happen? Because as you mentioned, born without a right hand, I'm sure along the way there were many people who wanted to say to you, this this can't happen for you. But conversely, I'm sure there were people like your parents and the people closest to you who said, no, chase your dreams. You can do whatever you want. And Jim, you're a humble guy. I know that. But you're one of the most inspirational stories in, in Major League Baseball history. And when anybody asks me the most inspirational athletes I've ever covered, I point to you because to make it to the major leagues and to succeed the way that you did, how did it happen? You know, that's a great question. It was an improbable journey, no question about it. Um, I grew up in Flint, Michigan. Uh, and everyone, everyone knows more about Flint now than they did probably back then and the difficulty. But Flint was always a tough place to grow up. Um, and the, the truth of the matter is, I mean, and I can, I'll say it, I, I was driven. I was ambitious. I wanted to do well. I wanted to succeed. I hated losing. And I loved sports. I loved being a part of something. I loved being on a team. Um, those things called to me as a kid. And, but the truth of the matter is, as you mentioned, there's so many people who opened doors for me, you know, coaches, parents, teachers. And had it been the opposite, had it been like some of the stories I hear now of kids who don't have the same opportunities that I had or maybe are discouraged, I don't know that I could have made it through those doors. And that was the truth from little league to the major leagues. I mean, to have, to have the support and the encouragement that I had, I really consider myself incredibly blessed in those ways. Um, I'm proud of it now, you know, and it, I wasn't always, um, I didn't know how to, where my career would fit in, you know, and when I retired, um, or in my early 30s, I wished I could have played a few more years. There was some disappointment and struggle at the end of my career. And as the years have gone by, I've grown more and more proud of, of where I came from, the places that I played, and the people that I played with, and the story that it can tell. Your, your ability to do what you did with your glove 
and, and after you delivered the pitch to be able to then have your glove on your left hand. How, how quickly were you able to develop that as a youngster? And just what kind of confidence did that give you to, to be able to know, okay, I'm, I can be a pitcher and a fielder out here. Because I recall one story, I think you were a freshman in high school, one team bunted against you, six straight batters, and you yeah. got six straight outs. You fielded <laughs> all six. Yeah, you know, I, I realized pretty early that, that fielding my position was going to be um, – something that people tried to exploit, uh, especially as I started moving up the ladder and I got to the University of Michigan um, and practiced a lot. I mean, I, I really practiced my fielding a lot and, and I meet a lot of kids. I get, still get a lot of letters, emails, uh, tweets. You know, how do you switch the glove? I have, I have an eight-year-old, I have a seven-year-old, I have a five-year-old. And there's no perfect way to describe it. And it evolves, you know, it, it just took time. And I remember even in high school, fumbling with the mid and fumbling with that exchange and, and working to try to get the ball out and throw it to first base. So um, it took time, it took some effort, uh, but I took a lot of, honestly, I, I felt like I fielded my position in the major leagues well. And um, I, I, you know, at that level, there's no quarter given. No one's gonna take it easy on you. So you better know how to field your position. And I, I felt like I covered covered that area pretty well. Jim, I know you do speaking engagements now as well. And in, in one of the questionnaires, I believe you did for one of those speaking engagements, someone asked you who your favorite teammate was. And, and you said Don Mattingly. And, and you spent a couple of years around Mattingly. What was the impact that he had on you for you to call him your favorite teammate? Well, I love Donnie. You know, I mean, I, he, he – um, I had closer friends that I played with and guys, you know, other pitchers that I, you know, but there were, Donnie had, and, and you probably remember, Donnie had this little aura about him. You know, you can take the boy out of Evansville, but you really never took Evansville out of the boy, no matter how big a star or how revered he was in New York City. Um, I, I just remember the way he led that locker room. And, you know, it was an interesting locker room, you know, a lot of different languages, a lot of different music being played. Um, you know, we, we had, you know, like I said, Jimmy Key, Jimmy Key and Paul O'Neill and, and, and Jim Larritz and, and Molito Perez and, you know, just a lot of different personalities. But Donnie Locker, he had that, that sort of label approach day in and day out that, you just couldn't help but respect, and 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 his, he was so good. But you saw that it wasn't completely easy for him. You know, he, he worked. His work ethic was amazing. My first time in spring training, first time I ever met Donnie, was in pitchers fielding practice on the backfields in Fort Lauderdale. You know, ten days before the position players even have to be there, Donnie's out on the backfield with ten pitchers working on grounders to first base. And he's, a, you know, you're the AL MVP, and he's out there doing that. That was the dedication that Donnie showed. And plus, he was just a, just a phenomenally down-to-earth guy. Jim, you decided uh, to do a book a few years back with Tim Brown called Imperfect. Tim Brown, a, a great friend of both of ours, writes for uh, Yahoo. Why, why did you want to do this, and how happy were you with the way it turned out? I was thrilled, first of all. Tim is a great friend, and, and – I was thrilled that he would take the project on with me. We took it, we talked on the phone one day. I said, hey, would you be interested in doing this? And uh, we didn't ever know that it would be even be published or anybody had any interest. And to see you hold it in your hand still kind of takes me back a little bit. But, uh, you know, Jack, honestly, like I said, a book kind of helped me come to terms with uh, a lot of the experiences that I had. And, um, I still get a lot of cards and letters, as I mentioned, from kids and families and doctors and moms and dads, grandparents of kids who grow up like me, you know, and I never honestly knew how many of people were like me before I got to the major leagues and every ballpark that we went to. Um, and so I try to reply to those. I mean, I'm sitting here at my desk. I've got a drawer full of pictures and cards and notes and, um, and yet that, that half page paragraph that I can write to them um, never seemed quite adequate. And, you know, I mean, and so a book 
was sort of my way of, of laying it out, like saying, hey, you don't have to buy my book to figure it out, but this is, this is the story. These are the people. This is how things happened. And, and it has been a useful tool, and, and I've been so – working with Tim was phenomenal. It was the great joy of doing the book. Um, but to hear the feedback and to see people who it has resonated with in those ways um, has been incredibly gratifying. I, I absolutely loved the book. I, I covered your career and I know Tim well, but to, to see the story written in this form, as, as you said, was, was terrific. And I think a lot, a lot of people can learn from this and a lot of people can learn from you. And in these 15 minutes or so that we just spent together, there's a, there's a lot of wisdom and there's a lot of inspiration in everything that you've done and continue to do, Jim. And I, I just want to thank you for giving us a, a few minutes here right now. Well, thanks, Jim. Heck, always great to chat with you. Congratulations on your book with David Cohn. Uh, love that just as much. And, and um, uh, you know, wishing everybody well out there. I know these are challenging times and um, baseball is the great unifier. And I can't wait till we get back to rooting for our favorite teams and our favorite players and, and uh, seeing more of you on TV these days. <laughs> I appreciate your kind words. And uh, we, we may hit you up for a part two. So just, just keep, keep your phone ready. You may get a text from me at some point for a part two. Anytime. I'm always around. You guys take care. Thanks, Jim. See you, Jack.